Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Remy Rosenbaum and I'm the VP of Marketing here at Caserta. I'll be your host for today. At Caserta, we solve our clients' toughest data challenges by providing first-class professional services in technology consulting, development, and implementation. Our vendor agnostic advice, advanced implementations, and employee reskilling empower data-driven companies to grow their businesses. Our relentless dedication to finding the right answer to our clients' tough data challenges is a hallmark of our firm. Our projects incorporate emerging technologies and the latest in design patterns and innovative solutions through modern data engineering. Caserta's complimentary webinars by industry experts like today are designed to give you insight into today's hottest technological trends and issues. After the webinar, you're encouraged to contact us with any questions on how to apply what you've learned today to your firm. Following the completion of the webinar, a recording of today's presentation will be sent to the email address you provided. If you have any questions throughout the presentations, please enter them in the questions panel on the right, and we'll answer them during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. In today's webinar, we're going to explore using Apache Airflow to create dynamic, extensible, elegant, scalable data workflows on Google Cloud. We have two excellent presenters with us today. We have the Director of Data Engineering at SoulCycle, Dallas S. Simpson and solution architect at Caserta, Dovi Pogstis. Dallas is gonna give us an overview of how SoulCycle is using Airflow on Google Cloud Platform, and Dovi is going to do a deeper dive into Airflow and give us an understanding of its benefits, as well as invaluable expert insider pointers on pitfalls to avoid. Seriously, Dovi knows everything about it, so I hope you're as excited as I am. All right, so Dallas, uh, let's start with you. In one moment. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in today. I'm Dallas Simpson. I'm the uh, Director of Data Engineering here at SoulCycle. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about who we are as a company, um, we're more than just a workout. We are a 45 minute indoor cycling class. It is a powerful mind and body experience featuring high intensity cardio muscle sculpting strength training, and rhythm-based choreography. I can tell you firsthand, it's an amazing workout. But enough of that, let's get to the details here, shall we? <clears throat> so what I'm gonna cover here is more around the evolution of our BI and data warehouse infrastructure, what we learned from the process, and how we applied what we learned uh, to the architecture that we have today. And then, you guys will hear about Dovi, talk all about the wonders of Airflow. So I feel like the evolutionary journey that we have is, is a pretty familiar one for any of you folks who've been down this road before. Almost no one starts off doing BI with a well-defined, fully documented, dimensionally modeled data warehouse. It's just no one's that way on the outset. So what do we do? We run our reports off of a copy of production. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, too, as long as it meets your reporting needs, especially when it's dead simple and there's a minimal barrier to entry. And that's exactly what we did. So we leveraged a product called Aluma to replicate data from our RDS instance into a Redshift instance for, from which we then hooked up Looker2 for our visualization and reporting needs. And that served us quite well. But unfortunately, I'm not, no, no, I'm not gonna go into the nuanced differences between online transaction processing, OLAP databases and our associated use cases. But needless to say, as your business questions become more complicated, so does that associated SQL to query, to extract those results from a system that was never designed to answer those types of questions in the first place. And the problem really only compounds itself as your data set grows. So we had some motivation to re-architect. In addition to that, most of our data exists in silos, and we're only really looking at one data source that we're replicating into Redshift. And meanwhile, our, our clickstream, our marketing tools, our ERP systems, human capital systems, and so on, they all exist essentially in isolation with the only people who ever really look at that are the people who interact with the systems on a daily basis. And we were lacking that, that holistic 360 view of our business. And also, in the absence of a full-fledged ETL system, we still had a lot of instances where you have a human being manually pulling data out of one system and then manually loading it into the warehouse for these one-off reports that have to be run multiple times a month. And if that guy calls in sick, the report doesn't get run. So, and so we, we decided we were to re-architect on the Google Compute Cloud because essentially our 
engineering team had already made this strategic decision to uh, replatform on GCP. So we had that, that was an easy choice for us to select a cloud, cloud provider. And with that, we, we decided to use Google Storage and BigQuery for our data lake and our data warehouse. And now all we had to do was flush out the rest of the stack. Uh, initially, we considered using uh, Cloud Dataflow since it has this great unified model for batching streaming, and it seems like it's practically built for doing ETL. Plus, you know, it's cool new tech. Who doesn't like cool new tech? So unfortunately, the Python, we wanted to use Python, and the Python version of the SDK doesn't support streaming or JDBC databases. So back to the drawing board we went. Not to mention, it only supports Python 2 set as well. So ultimately, we settled on uh, using running Apache Spark on uh, Cloud Data Proc, uh, GCP's managed Spark Hadoop service. Yet, we weren't done yet. We still had to figure out how we're to connect this stuff together. One of our initial thoughts was because we're running RDS, AWS, and we're going to be running ETL process in GCP, we thought perhaps we'd replicate our MySQL database into a local cloud SQL instance in GCP to keep the data closer to where the compute was going to be running. <clears throat> but unfortunately, we we're running RDS, so this is going to be a little more complicated. The first obstacle we found was if you want to replicate uh, to cloud, replicate from an external master into Cloud SQL, you're restricted to only first generation instances of Cloud SQL, which are less performant and can be more costly than their second generation counterparts. In addition, you can't use the uh, Kubernetes Cloud SQL proxy with first generation instances either. And then on top of that as well, if you read through the uh, RDS documentation, they explicitly state they don't support replicating to an external slave outside of AWS for any longer than it takes to to migrate your application out. And we were planning on running it a lot longer than that. So the final decision, the final architecture we, we settled on was to establish an encrypted uh, VPN tunnel from GCP into RDS in our, uh, as well as our other data center as well. There we go. So we have all this data available to us. Now we've got to figure out how we're going to process it all. Uh, now we started talking to a few different companies and ultimately we settled on working with uh, Caserta Systems and it's been a great experience so far. And what, and what they came to us with was this um, multi-stage ETL platform consisting of a number of microflows. The first of which is the data source to landing microflow. So we would have Airflow, which Dovi will go into in more detail in a little bit, would, uh, would Airflow would handle the scheduling and then kick off the job, and which would in turn provision the data proc cluster and then execute the Spark job on that data proc cluster provision. And that Spark job would go out and either con connect to uh, one of our databases a query or begin consuming a pub sub stream of click stream and marketing data and then land that raw data in the into the landing area in cloud storage. The second step is the land to lake microflow, which in the same, same airflow instance would run a Spark job, which would pull in those raw files out of cloud landing and go then process them, you know, forming, forming cleansing, validation, imputing any defaults, and then conforming them to the model of our data warehouse and writing them out in Parquet format into our data lake in cloud storage, as well as collecting some metadata as well. And then, the final stage, we would, uh, the Airflow would take the, the, the files from the data lake and simply load them into BigQuery, where we hook it up to Looker, and then able, we're able to disseminate that data throughout the company to various departments. And just to give you a full overview of what the whole process looks like all together here. All right, very cool. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dallas. Now we're going to turn it over to Dovi, um, who's going to go deeper into Airflow. Bear with me one moment. All right, Dovi, over to you. Hello there, everyone. 
for those who don't know me, my name is Dobi Pokshtis, and I'm one of the uh, consultants over at Caserta. Airflow is a wonderful product. We absolutely love it, and we're going to dive into it. If you'd like a copy of this slide deck, you can look at the lower right-hand corner, and there's a short code to the PDFs directly, so you can follow along if your connection's not the best. First, let's talk about a little bit of history of ETL data pipelines, specifically how we used to do it. Subtitle, for real, this is how we used to do it. In almost every ETL platform, there's this wonderful thing called cron. Uh, that was the beginning. Everybody started to use it, and it's quite simply the dev's answer to everything. Cron does things uh, very well. It does one specific task. It will run a command at a given time, provided the computer's on, provided you know how to debug it, provided you made sure that your task runs perfectly. So while it has the strength of always running when you want it to, it doesn't have a strength in the fact that there are no logs, there's no, it's really difficult to debug, and you have to be fairly familiar with Linux. So then there came the natural progression of another project uh, called Supervisors or Supervisor D. And this product keeps tasks alive. Think of it as cron on steroids. Suddenly now you had logs. And not only did you have logs, you also had recoverability. It would fail, and if it failed, it keeps keep trying according to the presets that you define. Now, this was really great, and it does a perfect job for what it's programmed to do. But as you can guess, the same issue that existed in Cron, in the fact that it has to run from a singular computer, also exists for Supervisor. You have one machine that runs your task, and that's it. So it's really difficult to spread out the workload for an ETL platform until someone said, we could do better. So they took cron and they added some muscles to it, threw in a little bit of magic, and out popped the baby Airflow. <laughs> Airflow is an incubator project for Apache, but it was started by Airbnb. And it was actually only released on June 2nd, 2016. If you want to go read about it, you can. Now, this is amazing because this project has become almost a staple in many ETL platforms. And it's only been around for two years. It was inspired by Facebook because one of the engineers was at Facebook, uh, but he eventually came back and helped Airbnb to create this project. Now, and it was all based in Python. As the article here you see states, Python has become the language of data. Many platforms, many transformations, many languages are built around Python or other uh, SDKs to modify and massage data for our need. And so that's what they felt was the best thing for Airflow to be Python based. So let's talk a little bit about what is Airflow. Airflow is a ton of things. It's dependency control, allowing you to control when things interact. It's task management, recoverability, uh, charting, logging, alerting history, folder watching, trending, and my personal favorite, dynamic tasks. Airflow can give you a myriad of tools and uh, anything that you may need for your digital pipeline. So what you used to have to do, creating complex relationships and creating a YAML file or something like that to control the order of execution, you can allow Airflow to manage yourself, itself. And we'll go deeper into specifically what that is. Airflow has a lot of tools, a lot of power. And if you dive into it, it will simplify your life greatly. But let's talk about what Airflow is not. And specifically, it is not perfect. There are definite bugs within the system. Unlike some projects like Databricks uh, and Spark, Databricks, I don't know if you know, but they created Spark. And they have a monetary purpose to keep Spark going and improving because they have a premium product of Spark called Databricks. However, Airbnb does not have a monetary reason to keep uh, Airflow going. So it was donated to the Apache project. And so it's up to you and me. If you know Python, and if you want to contribute, please do. This product has changed the way that ETL has been performed in cloud computing. And we'll get a little bit deeper into that about why. Let's go over the architecture of Airflow. There are three main components united by a singular database. The web server UI, the scheduler, and the worker. When I first started working with Airflow, I was confused. Why did they separate that? Most utilities or processes you run, you launch it and it just works. 
Airflow has a wonderful tutorial that says, hey, launch the UI. Now try to do something. Oh, it didn't work because you're not running the scheduler. They don't really help you to understand why. But let me tell you why. In the world of cloud computing, you need to be able to spread out the workload. Having a beefy server like it used to be is not enough. One server is a single point of failure. And so what they made was a multi-tiered architecture that allows you to spread the work out. The web server UI can be connected to any box and it can be very simple and light. The scheduler is just the uh, tool that starts the jobs and it can also run on a light box. And the worker can be spread out to any number of workers. And so because of that, because you're using a centralized database, you can scale Airflow to either work locally or remotely. So that's exactly what it can do. It can run locally on your computer using SQLite, or you can scale it to use much more dynamic and complex configurations with Postgres or MySQL, scaling them out to singular computers or multiple thread clusters. Let's look at this. <clears throat> Here's an example of a master-slave UI configuration built on GCP. Three different compute engines, one for each of the processes that run, connecting to Google Cloud Storage for remotely storing the logging, all connecting to Cloud SQL, either be it Postgres or MySQL, and then all interacting, all the workers running through Google Dataproc, thus spreading out the job again, uh, interacting with Stackdriver, et cetera. This is what most people would think you'd need to do. Airflow, it's gotta use a lot of resources, right? Well, actually it doesn't. It can be very light. So let's talk about what we do at Caserta. We use uh, Docker, to virtualize the entire container. So we have a singular computer that has within it Airflow, Postgres, RabbitMQ, and Supervisor. Airflow we've been talking about. Postgres is a really solid and mature database. RabbitMQ is a messaging system. Think PubSub uh, from Google. It allows messages or tasks to be disseminated to multiple uh, computers. Uh, and if one of the computers stops responding, that task is put back into the queue. And then of course, supervisor. I'm gonna warn you right now, Airflow is not perfect, right? And one of the ways in which it's not perfect is a scheduler. Sometimes it will randomly crash and you don't know why. So that's why the use of supervisor is so crucial. Remember that slide before we talked about how supervisor does one thing great. It keeps processes alive. And so we load supervisor in front of all of these processes to ensure that our Airflow instance runs perfectly without any flaw. And if anything crashes, it relaunches and we have a log. So we place everything on a singular Google Cloud Engine VM. And I know you're saying, excuse me, but seriously, no bull. <laughs> this is it, a singular N1 standard two, two CPU, eight gig of memory box houses an entire platform. Right now we have one client uh, that is in production, processing gigabytes and gigabytes of data, over 30 complex tasks that interconnect and scale as needed, all running from a small little box. Airflow doesn't need the resources. What, it, what needs the resources is the worker. So if you're going to run your processes and your tasks, on the worker boxes that you're running, then of course your workers have to be more complex, more beefy. But if you're using a uh, AWS ERM or Google Data Proc or something like unto that, then you can keep your Airflow instance extremely light. I mean, I think this is 35 to 45 bucks a month to run the entire data platform and manage all relationships and connectivities. It's pretty amazing. Airflow is incredible. To dig a little bit deeper, let's talk about what an Airflow DAG is. It's the governing force between, behind Airflow. Let's talk about a few of these concepts. A DAG is a directed acrylic graph. It's a collection of all the tasks that you want to run or interact with in a process. And it's, of course, written in Python, the language of data, right? On the right-hand side, you will see a full example of a DAG. This is it. A DAG is a collection of tasks, as we've said, and an operator is a description of how a task is performed. If you look here, we have a Python operator. Now, a Python operator means that this task will perform and run a Python method function right here in this code. 
So as you can see, Python callable my sleeping function. Here's the function, my sleeping function. There are a myriad of operators, and they're easy to program, so you can make your own. Bash operators, Python operators, email operators, MySQL operators, data proc operators. Anything that you need to execute in any way you need to execute it, you can program through a DAG. You can even program the user that runs those tasks. It's really powerful. So that's what an operator is, the method in which a task is executed. Once an operator is instantiated and arguments are added to that operator, it becomes what is called a task. And that's what gets performed in the execution tree. Let's take a look into the Airflow UI. Now, I've gotta be so honest with you. I love Airflow, but this UI is so counterintuitive and honestly quite buggy. They're improving it with Airflow 1.9. Uh, but they're also changing some things that other people aren't enjoying. But either way, let's go through this a little bit. I'm going to focus primarily on the pain points so that you can learn what I had to learn through experience and hopefully alleviate your pain and suffering. On the left-hand side, you see these on-off switches. Nothing in Airflow will run unless it's turned on. Even if it's there and you try and hit this play button right here, nothing will happen. That's another fault in Airflow. If you try and run a task and something is not set perfectly, it just won't run. It won't tell you that it didn't run. It will just say, hey, run, and it doesn't actually perform. So make sure that you have your switch turned on. This is, of course, the name of the DAG that you've provided. A word of warning, if, even if you have multiple files with different Python files uh, showing different DAGs, if they use the same DAG ID, only one will show. So be careful of that. Make sure that these are truly unique because it's imperative. Right here is something that every Linux developer should know, every DevOps guy, cron. Isn't it beautiful? Right there. That's the schedule of execution for this specific DAG. The next row over is the user, the user that gets executed as this task runs. The recent tasks, I'll show you a slide here in a second, shows you progress for all the tasks for that given DAG. Any successes, failing, failures, anything that's in waiting or retry mode, so that you can see where your status is. Last run. In Airflow, everything is based in UTC, as you can see in the top right. But one thing that's really difficult for a lot of people and a massive frustration for me is the fact that dates are so different than any other platform. If you're running a task right now at the second and it just finished executing, you would think that the last run date displayed would be today. No, the last date displayed for a scheduled task will be yesterday. Because the concept is start and end date, the start date is the date that you affix to everything, which is really quite unique because if you press play and manually run one of these tasks, the date present will be right now. So just be aware of that. Dates are a day behind in Airflow, and you may have to normalize that because if you run through things through Airflow test or backfill or you press play or you run through scheduled, they all have different dates of what is the start or what is the end or what the date should represent. So be aware of that and encode your taskingly. The DAG runs is a listing of the successes, failures, retry, or status of the entire DAG, all the tasks that are being executed. Here's a view that I found on the internet. I do apologize for the pixelation. Uh, it's not the best, but it shows you a bunch of different statuses that I'd like you to see. Right here, the circular green means that this task is running. If it's circular black like this, that means that the task is queued. Not quite running, but the scheduler is said to run it, and we're waiting for a worker to pick it up. Red, of course, are failures, and yellow means that it's in a retry mode. Uh, you can specify how many times to retry. You can specify methods to run on failures, on success, on retry. There's a lot of flexibility in Airflow. Here's another example of a production environment that we utilize, that we have, uh, showing all the tasks. So here is an example. Let's look at Dynamic Lake Prod. There are 30 tasks in this execution. This has run 147 times, but as we've stated before, it was run on the 6th, not the 7th. So just remember those dates that uh, they may switch you up and get you a little confused, and there is no easy way to set 
the airflow instance to your time zone short of changing the machine's time zone. So just also be aware that you will need to work in UTC with airflow. Now this is a UI that is a little painful. And so that's why we're gonna dig really deep into it. This is the task window that occurs when you click on any given task in a DAG execution tree. You can perform actions on a task and affect all tasks after it accordingly by this window. But it's not very clear. Right here is the run button. The run button, of course, one would think if you click run, it runs. But that's not always the case. It will run if it hasn't succeeded or it hasn't failed or it's not in retry mode. Airflow will tell you that running task, but nothing will ever occur because there's already a status in the database. Remember our triple architecture out there? UI, worker, and scheduler? The UI is saying, hey, click run, okay. But the scheduler goes in and says, hey, it's already been run. So we're not gonna actually do anything with it without any response back to the UI. So be aware of that. You have to think about things. And we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more. You'll notice these other tasks, ignore state, ignore dependencies, et cetera. Those are pieces that re refer to before. If there's a task before this task that needed to be run, if it's not run, this task will never run. So in other words, if it has an upstream dependency on something before running this, it will never run until that dependency is met unless you specify these tasks. So now let's go to the next step, clear. Oh, clear, it's a wonderful tool, but it makes no sense. But let's put it this way. Clear clears out the state in the database so that the task will actually run. So if you have a task that is in retry mode, even if you press run a million times, if it's outside of its retry window, meaning that it's still waiting for that timer to execute, it will never run until you clear it. Clearing is extremely powerful. As you can see, it pre-selects downstream and recursive. And that means any task after this item that is a downstream item to it or recursive item of this task. They will all be cleared out if you press clear here. If you press on one of the first tasks in an execution tree and click clear, you will essentially clear out the entire DAG. So if you're trying to execute one singular task over and over again, be careful and unselect downstream and recursive so that you're only running that singular task. Otherwise, it will run over and over and over again. So just be aware of that. Remember we talked about dependencies, upstream dependencies. A process won't run if its upstream dependencies aren't met. That's what mark success is for. If you need to, if you have a task before that you don't care about it running anymore, you can mark it as success um, and it will continue forward. Again, a word of warning, if that task is in a retry mode, um, if it failed for some reason and it's on that timer, you'll have to first clear that item, then mark it as success. Now, one other thing that you'll see here is view log. This is the worker log. Every task has a log attached to it and a timestamp uh, appended to the file, uh, which is fantastic. So you can go in and see what happened. Now, word of warning, if you clear out a task and retry the task, Airflow will not create a new log it will just append to the existing one. So if you've tried rerunning the exact same log 20 times, you'll have 20 execution logs in that log. So be aware of it and be careful of that. But it is a wonderful utility to help you load uh, and decipher what's going on. Now, the great thing about logs is with Airflow, you can even spread them out to work on S3 or uh, GCP, GCS, Google Cloud Storage. So in other words, you can take the worker logs on completion and upload them to a remote location. It's really powerful. So just be aware that that takes some configuration, but logs will help you just uh, determine what's going on. Now, I'm gonna be honest here. I wanna do some swap. If you haven't heard of this term, it's straight weakness, opportunity, uh, what's the last one? Threats, my apologies. And it's a framework for analysis for your company of what you can do to make things better. And I'm telling you right now that you need to think dynamically. Gone are the days where you need to hard code the time of which 
everything executes. I'm going to go through some examples. You can, oh, my computer is not working. My apologies. Okay. You can automate, oh, my apologies, everyone. Same thing happened the other night. Ah! My apologies. There we go. You can automate tasks by reading your source code and automatically detecting dependencies. I have some code here that I'm going to show you in a second that will allow you to easily create a dynamic task tree off a of DAG. That dynamic task tree will allow you, as the developers, to not have to manage those dependencies ever because the dependencies will be auto-detected by your source code. Imagine being able to commit some code to your repository of which your production branches run and never have to worry about where it gets executed or how. That's what Airflow can do for you. I'm going to show you a dynamic task, but there are other ways that you can do it as well with Airflow factories. But we'll go into that a little bit. But what I want you to think as a developer or a user of Airflow is how can you remove the human component? How can you remove yourself from the potential of failure? Because any of us will make a mistake. We're human, it's in our nature. But if we let the code dynamically detect the steps, then we don't have to rely on our human nature. We allow the computer to do what it's good at. So let's go through an example of that. This is where Airflow really shines. On the right-hand side is what's called a Python dictionary. In every other language, it's called a multidimensional array, but Python likes to do it in a different way, so we'll call it a dictionary. And as you can see, this is a specific dimension that is dependent on other dimensions. So topic billing frequency is a dimension table, a topic specific table that is dependent upon dim billing frequency and dim account as you see here. And this is topic payment method. So we have two different tasks that rely on two additional tasks. From this, we are going to take it and we're gonna allow Airflow to construct an execution tree. So the code that runs it all is right here. This is used in production. And let me go through it a little bit. This top section is for top level dependencies. So when you're going through your dictionary or a multidimensional array, use inner items. And these are the top level, all the, the, the top level tasks that need to occur. And we create a task for each and every one of them. And we public, put them in this other dictionary. We say, okay, here is this task that I wanna run. And I want to set create cluster as my upstream and delete cluster as my downstream, meaning that this task will never run until create cluster is completed and delete cluster will never run until this task has completed. Does that make sense? Upstream and downstream, just think of it. Upstream is below, downstream is after, or child dependencies. Now, after we've created those top level dependencies so we can affix the child dependencies to them, we iterate through the children. And we go through and say, hey, is this task here? If it hasn't been created before, we create it and of course create the downstream of the delete cluster. Otherwise, we set the upstream not to create cluster, but to the parent task so that the execution tree can be built accordingly by Airflow. What does this produce? Let's take a look. This is code used in production. On the left-hand side is a subset of the code that gets run every day. Every single one of these tasks is a different table that's being executed with an ETL transformation layer. But as you can see, many of them are interconnected. Dim account feeds fact revenue, fact complaint, fact HD snapshot, dim campaign feeds fact revenue, etc. And I don't have to manage this. Airflow, every time code updates or every time it goes to run this task, it will check all of my source code for the dependencies and construct this tree for me. On the right-hand side is a view of all of the dependencies. Remember I said this was a subset? I only ran from that code the tables that I wanted to, and I let Airflow detect the execution order. But this, if I had no limitations on our entire pipeline, this is a complete view of every dimension and fact. 
created every transformation and all the interconnectivities of each. And this is all dynamically built. And as I said before, this is real code being used today. So if you can think in that process and change how you've reacted before, think about how you can remove human mistakes from your code. Think about how you can take airflow to allow it to take you to the next level of your transformation. Airflow is phenomenal and we're here to help. So if you have any questions or want to learn a little bit more, please reach out. And obviously, if this kind of stuff excites you and fills you with joy, come work for us. Caserta is a fantastic company. Or with SoulCycle, they're amazing as well. And they're using some great things with data. Again, in the lower right-hand corner is a slide deck. And feel free to reach out to me or anyone else at the Caserta team. We are here to help you. I'm going to turn the time back to Remy. Thanks, Dovi. That was an insightful presentation. And everyone, we welcome you to ask any questions right now in the questions box uh, on the right. Um, bear with me one moment, and I will start with the questions. Uh, first, we have a question about the graph. Um, I believe this is for you, Dovi. Um, one of the attendees says the graph is not uh, acyclic. Would you be able to discuss the graph and, and why it is and go into it a little bit? Sorry, repeat the question again. Uh, we have a comment about the graph, that it is not an acyclic graph. Would you be able to discuss it and uh, why it is? I believe this is going back to the beginning I, of your I got to be honest. I'm not a, I, I'm not a data scientist. Per, I'm not a deep level data engineer. So I, all I know is that what's, is what Airflow says it is. OK. And that's probably a better question for the Airflow team. Uh, we have another one. Um, this one you can also take. Do you have a list of the tips that you were going over for airflow um, and the pitfalls to avoid uh, for these mistakes? I should probably build a list. Um, and the dates are definitely a, a tick. Uh, execution is a, a tick. Uh, Remy, should we make a list and provide that after this? I think that'd be a great idea, actually. Um, so to all attendees, we, we will create a list, um, if that answers the question of who asked it, and uh, we'll publish it afterwards, like a little uh, cheat sheet for Airflow. Dovi, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, Dallas, yep. uh, question for you. Um, why did SoulCycle go with GCP? I think you touched on a, one of your slides, but... Uh, um, yeah. There, there, there was a couple of reasons. Primarily, primarily because it was cool, and we wanted to build things, start building things, and go on the uh, application side. And there, there's also a number of cost saving fee. We like the cost saving features that uh, Google offers, where it'll make recommendations to say, "Hey, you're spending too much on this. Maybe you might want to provision a lesser system." Or as well as, uh, especially with BigQuery, to the uh, almost like not quite a paper usage model, where you can actually get better savings over say Redshift, for example. And on top of that, we also are have a strategic partnership with Google. So it just made sense to align our stack with them. Sure. Um, we have another question. Uh, what are the capabilities of Airflow for handling job audit metrics? Can we pull a report out of it? So Airflow has its own database that can be Utilize in, in a certain way if you want, but probably you'll want to tie in your own reporting system. We found that because of the triple architecture, things were a little bit uh, extrapolated. And so we created what was called a job tracker that managed and processed our jobs and the status of each job and basically wrapped our execution in a try catch so that we could catch and report and log errors. So while you can probably pull information out of it, uh, it's not exactly simple. Of course, it's over open source and it uses Postgres or or MySQL, so you can easily go into that. But it can be a little bit um, more information than you want because uh, Airflow is very verbose in the database, if that makes sense. Uh, this one's for Dallas. Uh, what version of Airflow are you using right now? Uh, we're using the version that uh, was deployed. I'm assuming it's the latest and greatest one. I don't have that number offhand right now, unfortunately. Okay. 1.8, so I believe, uh, not using 1.9 because 1.9 has some logging uh, differences. And so we have to make some modifications to support that. They completely redid the logging. So 
Great, thank you. Uh, so we have a question about uh, airflow security, specifically about um, Kerberos integration around Hadoop. Um, is it in flux? Is it mature? Can you talk about the airflow security apparatus? Yeah, so airflow security is pretty light, to be honest. And what we end up doing is we don't publicly face in any way uh, our airflow instance. That's why GCP is really powerful, is because they create an SSH tunnel and an IAM layer to the full interface. So our servers, while running, have no public facing ports at all except for 22, which is all controlled through the Google authentication layer. We then do an SSH terminal, uh, that tunnel rather that launches a Google Chrome using that proxy, and that's how we interface with the API. There are plugins like LDAP, et cetera, uh, but they're not as mature as I wish they would. So your best bet is to secure airflow in another way, um, but you can dive into that world as well. We just chose to use Google as our uh, backbone of security or AWS in a private subnet. Okay, we have another question. Why would you not use cloud data flow? Do you want to take that, Dallas, or do you want me to? It's up to you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I touched on it a little bit in, in my uh, presentation earlier. It mostly is because we, we're a, we're a Python shop. We're doing this, and we don't have any Java expertise in house. And basically, the Python SDK, Beam SDK, is quite limiting. It, with especially, if it doesn't support uh, streaming like PubSub or Kafka. Nor does it support JDBC databases, which were two of the primary sources we'd be extracting data from. Basically, I think it only allows you to uh, use uh, various file formats for inputting and outputting data. And that would have then meant we would have had to build an external service to then ingest data from these sources. So it, just, it was just simpler to use Spark instead on Dataproc. And a little bit more detail on that myself. I used Dataflow three years ago when it first kind of came out. And it was going and progressing, but then they switched to Beam, and they kind of allowed the community to go in different directions. And so the Python SDK didn't get as much of the love as it needed to. So it's, we've been waiting for streaming in Python for three years. Um, so while it does things very well in Java, it's limiting greatly in Python. Okay, Dallas, I think we have another question for you. Uh, what executor are you running, and have you had any challenges dealing with running Airflow at high concurrencies? Um, none yet. I mean, we're, we're not doing any of the processing in Airflow. It's all, we, we split up data proc to do with the actual heavy lifting. So Airflow just handles the scheduling and the uh, provisioning of the data proc cluster and kicking off the Spark job. And then from that point on, uh, Spark handles all the heavy work for us. So none yet. None yet. Okay. And we have uh, just two more questions and I think we're going to run out of time. So the first is, does Airflow provide APIs to extra metadata about the tasks in the DAG? For example, say business metadata like description of a task was annotated manually. Dove, you want that one? Uh, Airflow will, yeah. Airflow allows you to store data. Uh, you can return a response to every execution and it will output that information and it will store that. But uh, one thing that is lacking in Airflow is an API endpoint. So if you're looking for a REST endpoint, it doesn't exist yet. So please contribute and create it. We would all love it. Uh, but Airflow is a little bit limited again in the return. It's more of a process execution, not so much an artifact storage repository. So you'll need to build something like that externally. Okay, and we're gonna go to our last question here. I just wanna to say to everybody, you can uh, ask any further questions you'd like to Remy, R-E-M as in Michael Y, at Caserta.com. So the last question we have time for is, how do you handle DAG deployment? So what we do actually is, it's fairly interesting because we're, we don't want to follow any anti-patterns. And so what we end up doing is we utilize GitHub as a primary repository, but we use Google Cloud source control to clone that GitHub repo. We create a branch for every environment that we're working on. And we only allow certain people to promote to those branches. So say we have 30 people on our team. There are five people that can actually promote from our integration branch into our dev branch. There are only five people who can promote up to the staging. And then there's only two people that can promote to our production. That way, whoever's doing the promoting has gone through the wherewithal, the, the uh, task of testing everything. 
as things are executed, we have an, another DAG that runs to pull from that specific branch fetching updates. So whenever they're merged into Git, within 15 minutes, those changes are deployed. That's one approach. Other people can use things like Jenkins or some kind of build process to deploy. It really doesn't matter, but I will warn you as a, a, so that you're aware, remove your PYC files because Airflow has a tendency to cache them and relaunch the Airflow UI. Otherwise you have about a 15 minute delay before it'll update any new DAG code. Uh, so those are two limitations to be aware of. Okay, great. Thank you. That's all we have time for today. Uh, I hope you all learned about uh, Airflows and you'll be applying it at your businesses soon. Um, again, feel free to reach out with any comments or questions on uh, Airflows or any other uh, data problems to remy at custodia.com. Thank you, everybody.